Welcome to the Dr. Berkson's Best Health Radio Show. This is our third show now on COVID, the respiratory virus that started by the virus called SARS-CoV-2. And presently, we have 2 million cases internationally. Sadly, 128,000 deaths in a very short period of time. And it's reported this upper respiratory virus that also attacks many other tissues in the body in every single continent but Antarctica. In the United States right today, this is April 15th, which normally would have been tax day, but that's been postponed a bit. The United States has about 622,000 cases and a little under 30,000, 27,586 deaths. So this is a very serious topic. We just had Dr. Leo Galland, who's an internist immunologist from New York City. And you know, a lot of videos are going all around, many of them not good, many of them conspiracy theories and totally bad science, and some of them quite extraordinary. So I bumped into a video with three players, a seasoned ER doc, critical care person, ICU person, talking about a combo therapy that they've been using. And I called up Dr. Keith Berkowitz, who is the founder and medical director of the Center for Balanced Health in New York City. He's right in New York City. And he's kindly agreed to be on the show today. So I'm going to let him really do most of the talking as he updates us on COVID, this new um, treatment that they have discovered and his results with it or his experience with patients. So welcome to the show, Dr. Berkowitz. Thank you so much for having me today. You're pretty incredible. Just to p- give people a little idea, you're the medical director, had been the medical director of the Atkins Center. Everybody knows about Atkins for <laughs> complementary medicine. Atkins was a mover and shaker in, in integrative health care. So you work closely with Dr. Atkins until the time of his death. That's pretty extraordinary. So you merge a lot of your own allopathic regular medicine with what you experienced with him. And you also served on the teaching faculty at North Shore University and New York um, University School of Medicine. You were on the medical advisory board of the National Foundation for Celiac Awareness, which is pretty cool. And you also co-authored the Princeton Review of Medical School Companion um, and then some other very outlier, very cool books called The Stubborn Fat Fix and The Complete Idiot's Guide to Flour-Free Eating. So I really felt like, oh my goodness, this guy helps <laughs> deal with COVID and he's also nutritionally oriented. So we're going to put the links to all of your books and how to get you down below in the show notes, which everybody now knows. But why don't you tell us what you're doing with COVID and what your experience has been? Can I start with a little antidote? So what's interesting, and you brought up my history with Dr. Atkins. So the reason I came to work for him is actually part of the treatment process today for COVID in the hospital. So when I met him uh, in 1999, I had met two of his patients who had cancer, both uh, terminal breast cancer, and both were told by their doctors they would die within six months, and both had lived 10 to 15 years later. And what was interesting, part of the treatment they were getting was intravenous ascorbic acid or intravenous vitamin C. And now fast forward 20 years later, we're now talking again about intravenous vitamin C or intravenous ascorbic acid, which is kind of interesting, you know, how that's kind of correlated itself. Is this that you come up with yourself or we're getting some papers out of Shanghai on the intervention of of IV vitamin C? And also don't don't most of us that have been doing IVs in the office get our vitamin C from China? <laughs> Isn't that where we purchase it? <laughs> it is actually true. Well, what's interesting, and it's again, so, and I'll tell you how I got into this. Actually, I was sitting in my office about two and a half weeks ago with my nurse practitioner. We're like, something doesn't make sense. You know, people are dying. They're getting to the hospital. And then we hear, as soon as they're on the ventilator, mortality went through the roof. In one study in the UK, it was... Of 98 patients, 66 did not leave the hospital. You know, they ended up passing away on the ventilator. We're like, something's wrong. Something doesn't make sense. So I actually came across some research from a doctor, Paul Merrick, who's at East Virginia Medical School. It turns out he's probably the top critical care specialist in the United States. So he did a research study that was published in 2017 on patients with septic shock that went to the ICU. What really that means is those are your most critically ill. 
that end up in the intensive care unit, oftentimes on a ventilator because they're not able to breathe themselves. And what happened is he used a therapy called HAT. And it was a combination of hydrocortisone, which is a steroid, intravenously, ascorbic acid or vitamin C, and thiamine. And he used that for the sickest patients that came into his ICU. And over his time period, he's probably treated about 1,700 patients with that therapy. And what he found is, in his studies, that mortality dropped from 40% to 8.5%. And people with sepsis, yeah. presenting sepsis. with sepsis. Okay, which is... Or yeah, septic they, shock. And why don't you just give a little... Most people know what this is, but just give a little definition for some people who don't. Yeah, so sepsis is when the body is overcome by infection. So that's where you have trouble maintaining your blood pressure, maintaining your breathing. Um, oftentimes, you're at higher risk of blood clots. And these are the people that end up in, in the ICU the sickest. What's interesting is the most common reason people end up with sepsis is actually pneumonia, by far. So here's a gentleman in 2017 published this study saying this combination worked. And I'm like thinking from my experience, and, and you know you, from your experience, we've been using vitamin C for years. And it turns out that vitamin C and intravenous steroids actually work synergistically together they actually work through a similar pathway. So that actually together, they work much better than when given alone. Can you talk a little bit about that pathway? So what it is, it's, it's called, um, interesting enough, a sodium vitamin C transport pathway. And what's interesting is they both work on one main condition, which is inflammation. And to take a step back, what we're so worried in COVID, it's not the virus itself. I mean, you know, you hear about many people get the virus and they're doing okay. What ends up happening, the people that are sickest and get hospitalized, it's because this overwhelming inflammation process takes over. So the virus causes inflammation, and that's what ends up getting sick. They end up becoming in the ICU. You know, every day you hear about ventilators, needing more ventilators. Those are the people that get the sickest, which is very different than influenza, right, which is the virus we're very used to, the flu, common flu, which actually people actually end up getting secondary pneumonia, and it's the virus that actually causes the health issues. So here we're in a whole different ballgame, which is inflammation, inflammation, inflammation. So it turns out that both steroids and ascorbic acid or vitamin C are very strong anti-inflammatory agents. They lower and, inflammation and dramatically. together, they're better than each one by itself. That's what you mean synergistically. Exactly. So there was, I actually, so I want to say, okay, I read this guy's research. Let's find someone else who's not him. So there was actually a research study done in Chicago. Right, you want to see if it's replicated. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> You know, I, I think if you hear uh, Dr. Fauci talking, it's double blind study, double blind study. Unfortunately, this is actually field medicine. It's n- well, we don't not have time, time for, for double blind studies at the <laughs> moment, right? Yeah. And actually, I'll take a step back. In my background, I trained in the 90s in, in New York City during the HIV epidemic, which is very similar for us, where we didn't know what worked. We were trying all right, different things. Right, exactly. And actually, I remember that actually we were treating people who were intubated on the medical floor. We ran out of ICU beds the same way they have today. So we had really? patients on a ventilator on a regular medical floor. Just just a little so, note. It's so funny because I just finished a radio show before <laughs> this on low-dose naltrexone. Actually, uh, Bernard Bahari was actually came up with LDN by being in, in the front lines with the AIDS epidemic. So anyway. Great treatment. So I use it a lot actually in practice. So... What's interesting about that, so we learned, and the study that was done in Chicago was done at Chicago Children's Hospital. So again, you think of anything done at Children's Hospital, okay, you have to believe it more. So they actually, what they did is they actually added a new arm. So they had a control group, which is a group that didn't get the treatment. They had a group that got steroids alone, and they had the group that got the thiamine, the vitamin C, and the steroids. And it turned out the group that got the steroids alone had a mortality rate of 30%. The control group had a mortality rate of 28%, but the vitamin C, steroids, and thiamine group had a mortality rate that dropped to 9%. So to me, that's pretty significant. So if you can drop mortality by two-thirds, that is tremendous. So why do you think um, the thiamine was added? So thiamine is really interesting. We know thiamine as B1, right? We use it a lot in practice. It turns out in overwhelming infection, it clears this molecule called lactic acid. So lactic acid is something that builds up in the body when the body no longer works on what we call an oxygen-based respiration system or an energy system, and it actually becomes what we call anaerobic, 
it's actually a very toxic molecule that builds up within the system. And one of the measures of sepsis, we talked about that's the critical ill patient, is actually elevated lactic acid levels. Oh, interesting. So then now you're bringing to the forefront this information. So how did you move forward with it? So it turns out you would think, okay, everyone's going to be using this in regular practice, right, at this point, right? Here's a major study. It turns out there was another study in the middle that was called Citrus Alley. And the study was actually published in the Journal of American Medical Association, which is our premier kind of medical journal in the United States. And it turns out it was interpreted wrong. (laughs) So what they did is they looked at organ failure markers and they said, okay, they didn't get better. But uh, by the way, less people died, people got out of the ICU earlier, and they got off the ventilator earlier. But it's a negative study. <laughs> it's so funny how the interpretation is part of it. Look at the Women's Health Initiative. I mean, we won't even go there, but yeah, I hear you. And in my book, if people don't die, that's a positive study. <laughs> <laughs> so interesting enough, that one article has changed critical care management dramatically. Just that one line saying it was negative versus positive. Because it's if so you do amazing, a Google the fickle search, finger of fate and all these things, it really is unbelievable. There's so many people so do, missing out on it now. And you do a Google search based on intravenous vitamin C for treating these critical ill patients, it says there's no clear evidence because of that one word, negative. You <laughs> know, <laughs> when I was um, in, young in my career, I was practicing at the Center for Orthomolecular Medicine with one of the first functional cardiologists, and Linus Pauling had his lab just around the corner. So we used to go there and, and listen to talks by him on the efficacy and um, <laughs> the science behind this. It's so bizarre that one study could stamp out so much. And you think someone who won not one Nobel Prize, but two, would right. be believed, right? Right. So I think he's the only one ever to win two. So, And so what ends up happening, eventually now we're seeing more studies about it. And there was an actually a recent study just published less than a month ago that was an analysis of 10 studies and almost 700 patients where they found that intravenous ascorbic acid actually decreased ventilation time. And again, that's the time on mechanical ventilator by an average of 25%. So what dosing are you talking about here? So what they're doing, and again, remember this is for hospitalized patients that get hospitalized. They, They actually started a dose of three grams every six hours of intravenous vitamin C. Um, for the steroids, it's a loading dose of either 80 milligrams of what we call methylprednisone, and that's continued at then a dose of 20 milligrams every six hours, and then it's 100 milligrams of thymine every six hours. Now, I had heard that you had also been adding to this recipe, so to speak, um, because COVID is also a hypercoagulable state that you've been adding heparin. Is that true? Right. So the interesting part about it, absolutely. So what's interesting about it, and a lot of this comes from when we really got to look at the data from Wuhan, and actually it was also Shanghai 10th Hospital. We were wondering, you know, and we first looked at it, said, okay, they use intravenous vitamin C, they sometimes use steroids, and they use heparin. What confused us is most people they hospitalize get put on low-dose heparin because of the risk of blood clots because they're not ambulatory. So we originally thought that was because they're not moving. But it turns out that's not the reason. It turns out that the overwhelming amount of inflammation causes what we call a hypercoagulable state and that the risk of blood clots in the lungs is dramatic. We're now seeing on the first autopsies, we're seeing the lungs really feel filled with blood clots. So a lot of the individuals that end up on the ventilator because of respiratory distress end up with blood clots. And what's confusing to us is our typical experience, which is the flu or influenza, that didn't happen. They end up having what we call inflammatory infiltrates within the lungs that fill up. And that can cause some, sometimes secondary pneumonias. People come in with the flu and develop bacterial pneumonia. So in that case, ventilation is actually helpful. And typically, they would be on a ventilator two to four days. What's happening when you mean with the COVID. regular flu, the bacterial pneumonia that's normally caused by the regular flu, a short Correct. round of ventilate the ventilator works, but that's not the case here. In COVID, it's 10 to 21 days. Right. And I read anecdotally at um, I'm on staff at Atlantic Hill Hospital in New York City on the voluntary staff, and they anecdotally they took them 70 patients who were on a ventilator to actually take one person off. So really the mortality rate really in the beginning was so dramatically high when anyone got ventilated, and they would be on there for three weeks 
or more. I think we're now reading anecdotally stories of people that have come off the ventilator up to two or three weeks. And there was this, I read the story yesterday about um, an emergency room nurse that was just taken off in Seattle. And actually part of the treatment was intravenous ascorbic acid or intravenous vitamin C. To help her get off the ventilator. Correct. What people don't realize is that what happens is the patients that are the most critically ill, when they've gone back to measure vitamin C levels in the intensive care unit, they could be 80 to 88% deficient. So it turns out the immune system really doesn't work effectively without vitamin C. The problem is it's metabolized so quickly, you have to give it on an every six hour basis to be effective in those sickest patients. So how did you figure out the exact protocol and who are you using it on and how are you getting this information out there? So I can't take credit for it. It's Dr. Merrick at East Virginia Medical School. They actually do a rating of critical care doctors, and it's based on impact in the field, number of citations. So there's only one doctor in the world that has- What kind of citations? What do you mean number of citations? You don't mean parking parking spot (laughs) citation. You mean something else. (laughs) (laughs) That that could be a different measure. So what, what it means is citations from other doctors looking at his research or the impact he had on the field. So peer he's support, one of the, peer compliment. Okay. I like that. Peer support, peer compliment. So he's one of the highest and that, and he developed this back, you know, for years and he's treated over 17 patients. But that was vitamin C protocol. by itself, right? Vitamin C with steroids and with thiamine together. Oh, okay. So he's one that did that first triptych combo. Okay. Correct. Correct. And now it's been used. So he... And his first eight patients he saw in the intensive care unit, seven recovered. The only gentleman that didn't recover was an 86-year-old man who had severe heart disease, you know, had really comorbidities that probably come into the hospital without COVID-19, probably would not leave successfully as well. But then there's this Dr. Barone, who I talked to in Houston. He's had 24 successful cases, 24 patients, all admitted to the ICU, all were able to walk out of the hospital. So. Um are, when should this intervention ideally be initiated? See, the problem is, and the question is, again, we're talking to critical care specialists. So typically it's initiated in the intensive care unit. The problem with that is, is that the longer you wait, the higher the mortality. And what's interesting, if we initiate it, in, and this is, again, patients with respiratory distress, right? Individuals who have low oxygen levels, who are breathing labored really fast, Really, as soon as they come into the emergency room and are identified as having that issue, treatment should start. What's interesting, at University of Wisconsin in Madison, they, they did a study that's not yet published. They looked at 137 patients. They found if you gave treatment within the first six hours, mortality almost dropped to zero. But then once you waited 12 to 18 hours, especially after 18 hours, mortality really rose much higher to over 30%. How does this translate, if at all, to patients that are at home that started to come down with some of the symptoms more mildly and are now feeling like the symptoms are escalating? Is there any self uh, interventions we can do that are a spin off of this? Sure. So, actually, it's interesting is I mean, we're very lucky we have data from China, right? They've had their experience first. So, they actually looked at different supplements that had an effect as well. And one zinc, which even President Trump mentioned recently, you know, as part of the treatment protocol. And what's interesting, I, I know people have heard about hydroxychloroquine, right? The anti-malaria drug and of Zithromax. Right. Based on the Mersai study out of France. Right. Right. It turns out both of those medications work through zinc. So they both work by increasing the levels of zinc and they work through a zinc pathway. It turns out zinc has the re- property of actually decreasing what we call viral replication. It prevents the virus from growing. And and again, you know, you hear more and more viral load, viral load. And what's interesting to take that to the next aspect, that's one of the big fears about using steroids, because traditionally we've always thought of steroids increasing the amount of virus. Because they're immunosuppressive. Exactly. But again, if you think about most people, the virus don't get really sick, right? 80% are home. They eventually recover. It's that 20% that get very sick. That's because of inflammation, and that's why you need, in a sense, your strongest anti-inflammatory. So zinc and the doses they studied were between 75 and 100 milligrams 
Now, I've got a question for you. Zinc is a very, very uh, phenomenal mineral other than iron. It's the next most abundant mineral in the body. Um, but if, if it's a go- everything in the body's Goldilocks, too little is not good, too much is not good, too much zinc becomes immunosuppressive where just the right amount of zinc supports the immune system. <laughs> so if someone's at home getting sicker and they don't want to have to go out to the ER somewhere else, do- are those the doses that you would talk about? Or, or yes, how do you know those doses can- aren't doing the opposite? I mean, again, remember, a lot of it's anecdotal, right? Again, okay. we talked about before, there's no double-blind study that's out there. So again, we anecdotally know, and in experience with other patients around the world, that it does help. Again, you know, we don't have an exact dose that people would need. And again, and you're right, everyone's body's different, and their bodies may be different. Again, a 180-pound male is going to need a different dose than a 120-pound female, right? right? Their bodies, and again, we, we, that's why we approximate it to that level. So are you taking zinc yourself prophylactically right now? Yes. How much I can, are you I have taking? my supplements behind us. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to want to see milligrams. a picture of that. How, how much are you taking? I'm taking zinc too. 75 milligrams. 75? You know, it's funny because yes. when you get older, you have you might have this issue, so you need to take this for this issue, but it might make the secondary issue worse, which might involve the tertiary issue. So I've got glaucoma and you don't want to take too much zinc with glaucoma, but I want to take enough zinc to improve my immune system. So I've been kind of bouncing around as to what dosage will be my Goldilocks best and not create more issues. So it's always, as you get more new and improved and seasoned, you get more complex. (laughs) Right. Well, and again, everything depends on each other. So that's always the challenge. And there's never been any study that says, if you take these 10, how do they interact with each other? We don't know, actually. So are you seeing COVID patients right now? Are you using these protocols? So I've actually probably managed about 10 patients at home. The, for me, the scariest patient I managed, I had a woman with 103 fever for a week. So she maintained 103. It didn't go down. And, and for me, I was trying to keep her out of the hospital because, again, the hospitals are the sickest patients. About a week ago, Lenox Hill Hospital over they had 300 COVID patients in the hospital. Over 80% of the admitted patients had COVID-19. So my fear is if, even if she's not, if she's sick, she's probably not the sickest to try and manage her at home the best we can. And, and she recovered. I mean, you know, I didn't sleep for a couple of nights, but we made it through. So did you give her <laughs> prescription for heparin and for um, prednisone? No, we don't, or where, no, we did don't you use that. Where did you go with her? So you don't really really use that in the more mild cases. It's really okay. only for hospitalized cases. So in actually her case, I actually use Zithromax combined with zinc in addition to some other supplements. And I'll, I'll name the other ones in a second, but we did use that. And, and people ask why an antibiotic, right? We think about it's a virus. What people don't realize is that the antibiotics also have anti-inflammatory effects. So again, if we can stop some of the inflammatory process, the respiratory distress, which seems to be the most overwhelming symptom people developing from COVID-19 can, can be held off or stopped. So the, there was this scientist in France that was tasked by the French government to come up with a treatment for COVID. He started this study called the Mersai study, and he was the one, he for, did one arm that was control where they did the regular intervention interventional care, then they did one with hydroxychloroquine, then they did one with hydroxychloroquine, Quinn and Azithromax. So I guess because of his, he started out with 24 patients, now it's gone up to 90. So um, he was the one that showed that the combo really reduced the viral load significantly in six days. Why do you think he chose Zithromax, the old z pack Why do you think he, he chose that antibody? So z- it's, because again, we've shown the other one that also may work is doxycycline. So those are two that tend to be very anti-inflammatory. So oh. in addition to the, what we call the antimicrobial effect, right, their ability to fight bacterial infections, they fight inflammation. And in, in this COVID, the ones we're really most concerned about are these things called interleukin-6, which is an inflammatory marker, and tumor necrosis factor alpha. And I, I'm sure people have heard the cytokine storm. The cytokine storm is another word for the inflammatory storm. 
and they've been shown to have an effect in reducing that inflammatory process. You know, it's interesting because I just the show we just did, which I mentioned for a second earlier, was on low dose naltrexone, and it has been shown to reduce TNF alpha and be a very powerful anti-inflammatory. Do you have any? This is just a guesstimate. Do you think if people have been regularly on low dose naltrexone as a natural and uh, but it's prescription anti-inflammatory booster that they might be at less risk and be a little bit protected? I'm not sure. I have 20 patients of my own on low-dose nitraxone. None of them have got COVID-19 yet, so I don't know. But again, you know, it depends also risk. But again, I, I would suspect because it's an, a strong anti-inflammatory and brought some of those anti-inflammatory pathways that it would have a positive effect. And there's been a lot of confusion with different voices on both sides of the coin about hypertensive meds and whether they worsen or protect because the virus binds to the ACE receptors and um, it's all becoming about the ACE receptor. Can you make a few comments about what your feelings are about that? Sure. So if you look at it, it, a lot of people talk about it's an ACE2 level, right? So the good news is as a woman, you naturally have higher levels than men. So that's a good thing. So you think that's one reason that women have less COVID than men? Or less mortality, right? So women actually don't get as sick. And that's actually been shown. You know what nutrient actually helps raise ACE2 levels? It actually is vitamin D. So actually vitamin D has been shown to increase the ACE2 level. And what's interesting is the virus seems to hijack the ACE2 level. And and by hijacking, it prevents that what we call, it's called the angiotensin pathway it has an effect and that's how it enters the cell. So what's interesting, we see that actual mortality is the highest among actually those with cardiac disease, those with diabetes, those with hypertension. Is the question, is it because of that underlying or are they also on medications like in, um, ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers that could interfere? So it's well, very unclear. It's very unclear as to what all this means. So in other words, um, as people have disease and get older, their ACE2 receptors aren't as healthy and they're more vulnerable because they could be more easily hijacked. Young kids who don't get it as much or don't tend to get go to the respiratory acute scenario, they tend to have really healthy ACE2 receptors. But then there are those saying, hey, the medications would be better because they increase your number of your ACE2 receptors. And other people say, no, it'd be worse because they work through them. So there's been a controversy there. So what I've learned and what I've read, it's actually, so it's two different things. So it's ACE2 levels being higher is actually protective. It's That's almost that the too. virus yes. virus hijacks it. So by having more available, it actually helps. It's, it's what the problem is, it's inability to convert, we call something called angiotensin one to seven. And that's where the problem is. So that the virus sends you down a different pathway right. than you normally. And the, the worry is that ACE inhibitors and angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors block that conversion naturally to angiotensin 1 to 7 in that pathway. And that's why our concern is that it would actually cause the virus to be worse. I kind of, well, looking at it from where I've looked at it, I like the (laughs) idea that it increases it. And so it'll be very interesting to see how this whole um, understanding of the virus and attacking to the ACE2 receptors plays out over the tincture of time. We just really don't know yet, but it's very, very... But actually, I learned something. It was interesting. When I went to learn about that, the only research I can find is in hypertension. (laughs) So you have to actually go back into hypertension. And it turns out vitamin D is actually a very good anti-hypertensive agent. Oh, interesting. (laughs) But when all this happened, I called up... (laughs) <laughs> I called up Mark Houston. He teaches uh, the functional <laughs> cardiology course at A4M. And his, his, he said, we don't know for sure. We don't know for sure. But it looks like ARBs and ACE hypertensive meds would be protective. That was what Oh, yeah. Was, interesting. Yeah. And, and what's interesting, now I learned something else. You know, vitamin D does not work without vitamin C, which I didn't know. I didn't so, know that. What is <laughs> their collaborative? Uh, I couldn't find any research on it, but it definitely showed what happened is when they've tried in some studies, and these are the sickest patients that ended up in the intensive care unit to give high doses of vitamin D, it, it didn't always work in preventing the overwhelming infection. And one of the hypotheses was that they still had low vitamin C levels behind that. 
this really screams out loud that everything in the body works with everything else. We are, as a body, a team effort, as a planet, a team effort. And it really explains why when you go to see a functional practitioner, it's really not the one drug that they're looking for to treat. You usually have quite a large number of tools and you're addressing many things because they have synergism and hopefully will help whatever your condition is. So it's a different approach. Sure. Well, you know what I've learned is when we're taught, we talk with this top-down approach, right? We look at symptoms and we take symptoms. That doesn't really work. It's really bottom-up, right? Those with a strong foundation, at the end of the day, no matter what illness they have, they do much better than everyone else. But it's interesting that there are ACE2 receptors in the gut and people who presented mostly with gut symptoms tend to be people who fared worse. Yes. Absolutely. And it seems zinc may actually moderate some of those symptoms, interested enough. There is some literature out of China suggesting that actually one, and that was one of the early symptoms a lot of these patients got was digestive symptoms, that the zinc may actually moderate some of that by slowing down the replication of the virus. Oh, interesting. And you know, so many of the enterocytes that line the gut are zinc dependent, the parietal cell making stomach acid, making cholecystokinin. Those are all zinc dependent processes. It's very interesting how, and then your brain is just filled with zinc. You have, you might, you, it's amazing we don't walk around with our brain kind of tilting over the side. <laughs> so with heavy zinc metal. <laughs> but you know, it's, it's interesting about this. I feel like I learned one thing and then I have two more questions. <laughs> well, that's so everything honest... I learned, there's two more questions after that, right? Because then it's the next pathway. And you know what I always think, and this is the way I've always practiced, is you go as your digestion goes and your blood sugar goes. Those, I would think, are the two most important processes within the body to keep the, po- the body working functionally or optimally. I think that's So when ex- either of exactly those are disturbed, right. you really put your body at risk. That's exactly right. So you're... So- in this video that I saw, there were a few other players in this video. You had um, a, an ER doctor that had been there for 30 years. Um, my ex was an ER doctor, has been there his whole career, very seasoned ER doc. I actually sent the video on over to him. <laughs> but um, so can you tell me who's implementing it? You said you got, uh, also there was an interview in the New York Times on what you, you three are doing and it ha- how did you three get together, but the New York Times article isn't published yet? Who's using this? And how does a patient, if they have a family member that's really ill with this, how do they request this intervention? So there was really seven of us working together. So there was a, a five critical care specialists and, and two, one internist and one ER and uh, addiction specialist. So the five critical care specialists were around the country. One is out of East Virginia Medical School which is Dr. Marek, Dr. Verone, who's out of Houston, a United Memorial Hospital Center in Houston. There's a Dr. Maduri, who's out of University of Tennessee, Dr. Curry out of University of Wisconsin in Madison, and Dr. Glacius out of the health system in New Jersey. So it's really interesting. We had very different perspectives around the country and getting minds to think alike to see what kind of process we're doing. What we're finding as Northwell Hospital in New York City which is the largest healthcare provider in New York State, is using it. We've just learned recently University of Cincinnati is looking into using it, and it's slowly being adopted. I think as more and more kind of anecdotal cases are coming out, you'll see a much greater adoption of the protocol. And again, because going back to that one word negative has really you know, interfered with that being really promoted much more widely. And it's, again, we're learning really field medicine. I mean, none of us have really been trained that way, right? We're trained in a hospital setting. We're not trained in a mass unit in, in the battlefield. And again, now we're really at the battlefield where we really don't know how this virus fully works. We don't know how it attacks the body fully yet. We're learning slowly, but as we go along, we have to be able to be flexible in our treatment protocols. And what's interesting, we started without the full dose heparin when we first started coming up with this protocol. And as we've learned more about this, we've, we've adapted that over time. So what is the dose of heparin that you recommend? It's based on, and again, these are for patients only with respiratory distress. Right. And it's based on losing what we call low molecular weight heparin. It's one milligram per kilogram twice a day. So it's weight-based. So how did the seven of you get together on this? So I, I actually spoke to Dr. Marek first, and then he referred me to Dr. Verone, and then Dr. Corey. So I went around. And, and they all know each other. And we said, why don't we come up with together and do something to really promote this? 
And, and, and again, I think when you have more experts together with different backgrounds from around the country, you know, credibility becomes much better than if it's just one person saying it. So, for example, I work one week out of the month in Perlmutter's old clinic at the Naples Center for Functional Medicine. If we wanted there to get somebody to use it, because we've been trying to just even, Dr. Carol Roberts, who, who's the medical director there, has been trying to get local hospitals to use IV vitamin C to no avail. Is there anything printed up or what would we do if we have a patient there that's go, going down with COVID, if it's in the ICU, how would we get them or contact you or what might we be able to do to facilitate this? So we'll, we, we issued another press release. We actually have two calls once every week. We discuss what they're seeing in the ICU, what they're seeing in the hospital. Is there anything different? Do we have changes? I mean, over time, even the doses of steroids have changed. We've also saw in patients, if they develop something called a high ferritin level, which affects the way the liver works, you have to actually cut back on the vitamin C. And what's interesting about that, you know, who most typically has high ferritin is your diabetics, is your heart disease. So that's, again, that And same men are going to have it more than off. women because we're losing Correct. it every m- menstrual period, <laughs> right? <laughs> that might exactly. be another reason about that gender bias with presentation of this yeah. issue. And I think that's it. You know, what's really scared us is the first time, it's not only, you know, typical influenza, it's usually your two edges, very young or very old or immunocompromised of that are really having high mortality rates. Now it's not the case necessarily. We're seeing all age groups being affected. Do you think that's because the virus that we have in the United States is mutated from what they had in other countries that they're seeing more of the older? Because I know in Houston, they were saying they have more young adults getting this right now than they have uh, older adults. And I've heard the same thing in Brooklyn at Coney Island Hospital, that that's really changed. I mean, there's suspicion. There was a study just recently published out of Thailand that talked about up to nine mutations of the virus. But if you think about influenza, right, if we use that as an example, Think about every year the flu shot gets updated, right? Because it's a different virus. And again, even that, and if you look at the flu shot over the last seven years, the highest rate of success was about 30%. So you're seeing, again, a virus that we're used to that's not as virulent and not as strong as the one we're dealing with now mutate on a yearly basis very rapidly. So, you know, the strain we had in 2019 is not going to be the strain we have in 2020. Right. They're, they're evolving consciousness just like we are. So um, the big issue is immunity. So you've worked with a bunch of patients and you're testing them. We know that the swabs are very different than the fecal samples, but our big, if enough people get immune to this, you know, there's the herd immunity, we can stop it. But then there's been... Uh, reports out of China that people will test negative and they seem to be better and all of a sudden they're testing positive again. So we don't understand. What's your understanding of the immunity situation surrounding COVID-19? So the challenge is in two, I mean, we have the two earlier country model. We have the model in South Korea, right, where now they've had 100 people who have recovered test positive again. So the question becomes, is the testing the, the good? I mean, that's the question. Or does the, you know, virus still remain and you can be an asymptomatic carrier, you know, after the fact, or is this a new virus and a new infection? We don't know yet. I think the problem is we're such early stages of testing. And I heard an anecdotal case, which was interesting. This was out of Houston. They had a patient in the intensive care unit for the first four days tested negative. Day five tested positive. So who's going to have a higher viral load than someone in the intensive care unit? So here, this is a general, um, a person that didn't test positive for five days. The other anecdotal thing I've heard out of China is... That's this, frightening. It, yes. It, it, and, and someone asked me the other day and asked me, they tested negative. I'm going to see my relatives immunocompromised. Is it safe? And, and I actually couldn't guarantee that, right? I can't say a negative test is enough to be 100% negative. Again, we're told to, you know, when they do a nasal swab to do both nostrils. Not everyone is doing that. So that may also, again, if your viral load is not that high at that moment, you may not test positive and still ha- have the disease. So many unknowns, so many unknowns with this. Yes. Yeah. So what are your feelings about um, when we can start opening up society again? <laughs> what, what waves of exposure and and cases are, are we might maybe face Before I get that, I want to bring up the China thing that you brought up. That was interesting too. So in China, they think up to 30% did not test positive for the antibody. And that had recovered. That was their fear. 
so that they did start doing antibody testing. And it's harder. I mean, I had this talk yesterday. I'm on the board of a large nonprofit, and we're talking about summer camp in July. Is that going to happen or not going to happen? And, I, and I'm like, I'm the one doctor on the board. They're like, don't you have an answer? <laughs> we, so, you know, the Chinese doctors got together with the World Health Organization and they put out this huge paper. They put it out in February and I read this paper and, you know, we're looking at antibody testing, but they said, so normally when you test an antibody, it's IgG and IgM, but they said, well, to pick this up, you might need to have a whole array of antibodies and it might be a much larger panel and that maybe our antibody test panel is too skimpy, too skinny. Right. And, and I, so I'll explain what IgM and IgG is to people so they'll know. Oh, so IgM you. is really the acute process. So it's an immunoglobulin that happens in the acute process. Usually it's going to be positive for four to six weeks. The problem is often it may not be positive for four weeks. So you can actually still have a negative and turn out to be positive later. Whereas immunoglobulin G, once you've been exposed, that should always be positive. That's more of a long-term uh, you know, uh, immune marker. But again, if you don't have a, if you have a compromised immune system or something else, you may not test positive. So even right, if because you, you might not it. be able to <laughs> mount an immune response. So you really do have the disease, but your body's too tired to make those antibodies. So you're going to look like your antibody test. You don't have the disease. So therein we get a lot of issues with the testing. So in terms of, you know, how can you freely move through society? What, what's your prophecy? Oh my God. <laughs> Put on your <laughs> Moses outfit. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I think it really depends on testing. I think what the problem is, we're st I mean, no one's really been antibody tested in any large amount. So we're not even at that stage. And if you look at New York City, we're, we've been the hardest hit anywhere in the United it's States. Tragic. I think we have over it's tragic. 10,000 deaths now. And the point is, our curve is flattening, but it's not going down yet. So we're still having a large amount of deaths every day. We're not having as many hospital emissions. So if we, and, and it I takes think a while, the death rate it is lags behind the probably incident, about two right, weeks right. Or, or at least. But what's interesting, if it took us a month to get up to here, I would suspect it can go two months or three months or four months down the other way once we get there. I mean, if you realize this, I mean, I think, and I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, that I think with influenza they expect one person probably infects two or three other people at most, right? You know, if someone gets the flu... I really didn't know that get, stat, but it's good to know that. Okay. I may not be accurate about that one, but COVID, it could be so much greater, right? If you look at the rates of infection are tremendous. The there infectivity one, is amazing. They yeah. even talked about in the ICU, 40 to 50% of people had the COVID virus on their shoes, leaving the ICU. Right, right. And then it may be four, four meters, not six feet. <laughs> right. Yeah. Because it comes out when you're talking and you're just, you know, breathing. <laughs> right. It's really, really, you know, I'm all by myself. Um, I'm, I'm not married and I was <laughs> date, just starting to date. <laughs> Some of these gentlemen go, well, can I come on over and have a dinner? And, you know, it's only two people. And it's like, no, because I don't know any of the history of where they've been. It's just too, too unsafe at the moment. I, I think that's a whole new application dating in the, Era of dating and oh, I heard a really great <laughs> shuffle. It said in in 2019, you we talked about avoiding people who are negative, but in 2020, we talk about avoiding people who are positive. <laughs> right. I don't know what's next after that. Right. That's the two categories you have. So I mean, and this is Harvard study the other day that talked about maybe social distancing up to 2022. I mean. You know, it's so interesting. So I, That's it. I'm going to be an old maid forever, and I might as well forget COVID. <laughs> well, I'm just going to go myself I, I, into the sunset. <laughs> I talked about this camp that, you know, I work on nonprofit. It's 75 acres. So they're going to basically have one children, one child every 50 people. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone's going to be separated. It'll be camp from a distance. So. so do you think knowing these things, knowing zinc, knowing um, vitamin C, if you're you know a mom... Actually, I could talk a couple other ones. There's actually a couple other. Freaking I'd like that. So up. if you're a mom and you have family and you're looking what you want to do to just keep everybody healthy, because obviously we can't social distance enough. So we have to make our host healthier so that we're less vulnerable. We become the 80%, the 85% that if we get it, it's no big shakes. So can you talk about your bag of tricks with which to make you more immune successful? Okay, good. So I'm going to actually mention a couple of the supplements first. So another one, which is one of my favorite I've been using for years, and you know this one too, is quercetin. 
So quercetin comes from the skin of a fruit. It's called the citrus bioflavonoid. It's actually been really well studied. Actually, if we go back to HIV and hepatitis C, those are our viruses in the recent past that we really have developed a lot of fear from and spread. It turns out for the COVID-19, it prevents, some, it prevents something called heat shock proteins. Those are proteins that the virus actually needs to assemble itself. So quercetin, interesting enough, may stop that assembly process. And the dose they looked at is actually 500 twice a day of quercetin. Is that also, so there's an enzyme that helps the virus travel throughout the biologic highways in the body. I think it's called 3CL protease. And is it quercetin and other bioflavonoids that are 3CL protease inhibitors? Is that accurate? I'm not sure. I, I, that I don't okay. know. You may know more. You'll have to tell me. I don't know. <laughs> or, or actually, that's a follow-up question. We'll have to look up. We'll have a Zoom dinner and share. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. And, but again, so that's the other one that's really kind of interesting that's really popped up a lot is there's a lot of research now looking at melatonin. So oh, melatonin, yeah. which we talk about for sleep and cortisol, but they're actually looking at melatonin as a, a reason for innate immunity. I mean, if you know when individuals, as we age over 40, melatonin levels drop very rapidly over time. And they think that some of our innate immunity, or, which is our ability to fight infection, does decrease as melatonin decreases in our body. Italy has done so much of the research and they've shown that melatonin really boosts uh, T helper cells. And also it's, it reduces the interleukin-6 inflammatory pathways. So it also helps with inflammation. It's just, it's, I was a, um, a hormone scholar at an estrogen environmental think tank at Tulane University and David Blask was a medical doctor, PhD that worked there and he used to come and give talks in the afternoon. His whole career was based on melatonin. He was the guy that showed that it blocks glucose going to a tumor cell. So he, I mean, he's just done all this cool stuff. But melatonin, and I guess it's supposed to be sleep is such an aid for health because melatonin is one of the miracles of, of how it protects our body on so many levels. Right, in a hormone clinic, right? So it's interesting. I've always learned about melatonin in, in intravenous fertility studies. They actually use melatonin to help women get pregnant for that reason by supporting progesterone. So that's really interesting. Oh, that's interesting. Do you know about the randomized trial where they use melatonin in endometriosis patients? Yes. So yes. It's, m- melatonin is, <laughs> is, is absolutely a game player with all of the rest of our hormones. It definitely does that. So How much melatonin to, do you take? So again, a dose dependent, I think a lot of the doses were kind of smaller doses, 0.3 milligrams to one milligram. The highest dose we've seen is six milligrams in the studies. And again, you, melatonin is one you have to be a little careful about. The only people I see that don't tolerate it are people that are prone to vivid dreams. They sometimes can cause some of those to be worse. And I have seen in some patients. Well, the other thing is that melatonin, in, if you give enough, it can tamp down estrogen. So if you give it a large amount to a young woman, she could actually be, become a menorrheic for a while. She will stop menstruating. And that's what we use it for is an aromatase inhibitor and in in a, a nutraceutical tamoxifen-like <laughs> substance for someone has breast cancer because it tamps down the estrogen, which is a whole other story because good, bad, it's different. That's, a, well, that's actually my training. So my training at Sloan Kettering in my residency was breast cancer. So that really? Was my, yes. That's one of my favorite uh, topics we could have. We're going to have to have you back to talk on that. But you, what else were, did you have in your tool bag for COVID protection? So, so, so those are, and again, so then we talk about lifestyle and diet. I think what's so interesting, those principles really hold true. The one thing I see where people really get into trouble now is when they don't have a regular schedule. I think one of the challenges of being at home is we're so regimented on a regular basis. People get up in the morning, they eat breakfast, they go to the gym, they go to work. Now with that all thrown off, you know that actually is probably the most dangerous people thing people do is they end up not having proper meals. They exercise goes out the door. They stay up watching Netflix at two or three o'clock in the morning. They don't sleep regularly. And those are so important because people don't realize your immune system only works when your body shuts off. The model is, it's like a factory. You have to turn the lights off. You have to stop everything doing and actually recover. And that only happens throughout the night if the body is calm from that aspect. So restorative sleep is very important to try and get even in these COVID pandemic stressful times. Very important. And blood sugar. So we'll go blood sugar and digestion. So digestion, I always like using the term, and this is what I've really thought, is eating foods that are easily digestible. 
I kind of like always thought of that. And one of the things that people can do that's effective is actually not have a heavy meal at night. What people don't realize, if you have a heavy meal, you can actually end up going to sleep and still be digesting your food. If you're digesting your food and you're sleeping, your body's not resting. So that creates an issue. What a simple statement and what a deep statement that (laughs) is. That makes so much sense. You really want to get the benefits of your rest while you sleep. And if your body's digesting, you're distracting it. And again, if you're waking up bloated in the morning, chances are that's what's happened, right? If you're waking up bloated when you first wake up, you don't feel like eating or heartburn or reflux. Those are definitely things that can, you know, go along with that very clearly. Boy, that's that's a really powerful statement. You said that really well. I think a lot of people heard that but didn't quite get it, and you just delivered it in a way that's a big aha, I think. And and so with, with blood sugar, so the problem is now, you know, snacking and not eating meals. So I think, you know, it's interesting. Yeah, we need to social distance from the refrigerator. (laughs) (laughs) Or put a lock on it, maybe. But, uh, or you know what they should have is like time locks, right? That it only opens between for five minute or 10 minute periods throughout the day. I think someone was selling Tupperware with that on it the other day. (laughs) And and what it is, is that is your your blood sugar is still giving an issue. And again, I think what happens is when, you know, people will tend to, especially comfort, overeat carbohydrates and especially some of the refined things, sugars and, you know, flour products. And again, no matter what the disorder, those are still important for the body to function well, is to maintain proper blood sugar. What do you think is, you know, you, you, we talk about blood sugar all the time and people go in once a year and get this cursory small little set of blood tests that their regular doc runs. And if their blood sugar is 196, the doctor says, everything's fine, go home, you're okay, let's just wait till you get worse. What do you think are the ideal fasting blood sugars and, you know, how they compare to hemoglobin A1C and fructosamine and all that? So you picked my favorite subject. So oh, goody, goody. <laughs> actually, my, what I'm known for is actually a disorder called reactive hypoglycemia. So it, what that is, is when your blood sugar is not normal post-stress. So what people don't understand about disease is when you, when you look at disease in the relationship with blood sugar, it's actually not fasting. It's actually post-meal that actually has the risk. And it's actually not glucose itself. It's glucose in relation to insulin. So you can have a normal glucose level, but if you have very elevated insulin levels, the body's not going to function Properly. I mean, you do a lot of hormone stuff, right? Insulin well, in, is in one my, of those hormones. In my old clinic, we <laughs> ran a six-hour glucose and insulin tolerance test on everybody bringing in the meal they normally ate. Right. So again, and they may have normal levels when they start, but if you watch the insulin grow over time, that's really a disorder. And what people don't realize is if we look at the villain today in a lot of disorders, it's insulin. It's high insulin linked to from, you know, things from, you know, from Dr. Perlmutter. Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, to diabetes, heart disease. But also, if you look at who gets infections, those are your diabetics, those are your people with heart disease, those are your individuals with high insulin. And if I, if you trace back, and we'll see this after the COVID-19 passes, you'll actually see that's the group that's probably been at the highest risk. And that's the ones that had the highest mortality rates at the end of the day. So how do you, how do you normalize your insulin response? So one of the things you can do is actually what you put in your body. Well, one thing, we don't have control over a lot of things. One thing we have control of is what we put into our body, so food. And I, I think what it is is really balancing out your nutrients. Again, one thing that I always teach people, and, and people forget, so you, you have three groups. You have carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. People, don't, people know clearly that carbohydrates become glucose. I think you know, that's not a surprise to anyone, with fiber being an exception in some forms. But what people don't always realize is protein also becomes glucose, that the body 40, 50% right. through the liver becomes glucose. So that, even if you have a high protein, a lot of protein at night, you're still going to affect your glucose. And, and again, and the key is then fats. And when I always use fats, and I kind of use the term easily digestible food, so I tend in my practice to move away from a lot of raw foods, to cook vegetables and stuff, and have things of soup nature or really easily digestive foods like avocado, you know, scrambled eggs, things like that, that the body can digest quickly so that by the time they go to bed and finish eating maybe seven or eight o'clock, they're done for the night. Their body's said, okay. How many hours do you think it's ideal to stop eating before you go to bed? If we took the model we were growing up, it was six, right? People finished by six o'clock. 
I, I think if you at least four hours is necessary for sure. And, and the other yeah, of thing course, our really- whole lifestyle is against that. We <laughs> lay down on the couch, munching on something, lying down till we till we drag ourselves to barely be able to floss our teeth and brush them if if we can to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, here's the opportunity. Now you're at home, so you're kind of stuck. So if you can't, and I always tell people, this is probably the greatest time we're ever going to have that you can focus on your own health. Because think about it, if you eliminated your commute alone for most people, which could be one or two hours, that's exercise, that's reading a book, that's doing something positive to make yourself better. So you actually have gained an extra hour or two every day that you can use towards yourself now. Um, you mentioned that all of you, the seven, we're going to call you the seven. It's interesting. I used to work with uh, Dr. Jack Moncrief, who uh, co-invented the home unit of dialysis, and they he was honored by Sunnybrook, they got the seven nephrologists who made kidney medicine what it is today. It seems like the seven <laughs> births a lot of well, really seven cool days things. days a week, right? Seven days of a week. <laughs> right, that Beatles song, <laughs> or eight days a week. So, um, We'll find an eighth then, if that's the case. <laughs> if somebody wants to send this video to their doc, or there's a doc here listening to this, a lot of pharmacists and doctors listening to the show, is there a way they can get in on that phone call or get some information that was shared on that phone call? How, how do you have access to some of the information that's growing between your seven? So we just st- opened, started a website. Actually, if you give me one second, I will tell you what the website is. Oh, cool. It's I'm so glad I asked that question. Those. I'm really glad. Um, and remember, we are talking to uh, Dr. Keith Berkowitz, who's right there in New York City. And um, they've come up with this protocol of a combination of interventions when you're really ill in the hospital that looks like it helps people get through this with less tissue damage and less mortality. So So what I'll do is actually, what I'll do is I'll send it to you so you can actually post it. It may be easier. I'll I'll send it. And so we'll be able to, uh, and actually we just published a new updated video that's going to come out now. So every week or so we're going to update our guidelines based on what we're finding, you know, kind of on the front lines in a sense. And Will you send me that? Will you send me yeah. all of that? And give it, I'll put it in the show notes. Everyone knows if you go to Dr. Lindsay Berkson, D-R-L-I-N-D-S-E-Y-B-E-R-K-S-O-N.com, and you click on podcast, you're going to see this podcast. And at the bottom of the podcast, there'll be show notes with the website link and the other links that, he, that they deem to share with the public. And then um, also, if you love information like this and you like all the elbow grease that my uh, guests and myself are doing, you can go to iTunes and and leave a review. It's like a Mensa exercise. So we have it in three different steps at the bottom of each <laughs> show notes. <laughs> so do you, can you give us the name of the website now though? And we'll also put it in the show notes. Oh, okay. So you know what it is? What? I, I just, hang on one second. I just lost it. Give me okay, one well, second. Okay. Well, I'll hum a ditty while you're doing that. <laughs> so you could talk about hormones. That's your, you know, what about that? <laughs> which is so important now. Right, you know, the, the, I'll tell you what this really screams out loud. For example, um, we do know that pigments, plant pigments, block the enzyme that lets COVID travel throughout your body, but you can't just absorb them immediately. It's really how you've lived in the past so many years. So what your whole body's saturated with from the years of your mindful or not mindful living. So really your whole host defense to face something that comes as a threat like the COVID now has a lot to do with the decisions that you made and the choices you made over the last so many years. So on the other side of this, keeping that in mind, each time that you lift a fork, you know, this a fork is a fork in the road to make a good decision for yourself. And actually I made a mistake. There's now eight of us. So we're now with the Beatles song. Okay, so there's cool. now an eighth doctor. <laughs> and I'll just join us. So it's actually COVID19criticalcare.com. COVID19criticalcare.com. And there's no dash or anything like that? No dash, straight out. And then we'll post the new videos, the new updated protocols, and it'll be an opportunity to kind of, in, we'll work towards more interaction with that. Well, I got to tell you, in crisis, who you are really shows up. Just who you are shows up. Like I started writing these articles and doing a lot more podcasts on this. We're not, I'm not making any money. You're not making any money. This is because it's who you are. It's because you're one of, you know, the Kabbalah says at any time there's 36 really good men walking the planet. Well, you know, we want to be one of those good men, not because we're going to see so many virgins in heaven, but because it's the right and the good thing to do. And, and also I, I want to walk the planet. 
<laughs> yeah, I know. Give the planet a break. So you are you are one of those people, this group of eight, doing this for all of us to help out. And we so appreciate it. So appreciate that you would come on the show in the middle of everything that you're doing and take your well, time to you do so it. Much. Is there anything it's you want to honor. close with? Anything you want to close with? I think what it is, is I think, you know, one of the key points is actually, you know what, use this opportunity to really take care of yourself. I mean, I think what we're learning, actually, I watched a video just recently of uh, President Obama in in December of 2014 that said in five to 10 years, we're going to get a pandemic. And look, look, behold, five years later, in December of 2019, our pandemic started or January. So I think this is an opportunity really to take yourself. And number two is everyone has a voice. Medicine is changing more so because of people changing it, that your healthcare providers are not the only people that have influenced how medicine's practiced. Everyone does now. And we all have to join together to make changes. And our voice, voices being heard can really effectively do that. I love that. Oh my God, you're my new best wannabe best friend. And the other thing that Obama said is look at how rough this is on us now that the global warming is going to be our next pandemic and we should take lessons from this. And the bottom line of what Dr. Berkowitz just beautifully said, this is the time to learn how to keep yourself whole in body, mind, and spirit and pass that on through your family and your community so we could be stronger. So if other things hit, we can minimize the threat and their effect. Thank you so much for your work. And this has been a phenomenal show. Phenomenal show. Thank you. I want to stay in touch and I want to have a Zoom dinner and share some <laughs> cool things that we can help our patients that, with. That's going to be the new eating out method, right? It's Zoom dinner. We had a Passover Seder with my girlfriends from high school on a Zoom and she had, her background was a complete Seder table. <laughs> Actually, I did the same thing with Maryland, Florida, San Diego, and New York all on the same call. Well, I so, think, you know, a, a lot of good things are coming out of a terrible <laughs> thing and your message is really great. And, what and you're my doing. teenagers have to talk to me now because I'm around, so they have no choice. <laughs> <laughs> you have four kids. You have, yes. I asked him if that we were having some <laughs> IT things before the beginning of the show. He said, oh, I don't get stressed out about anything. I've got four kids. <laughs> well, thank you again for having me, and I, I wish everyone to be safe. Me too. Be well, everybody. Thank you again. Bye-bye.